Welcome back, theater design students. This is Professor Emily Seal, and we are jumping past a few chapters here to dig into style, composition, and design. Those concepts are um, really fundamental to art and music, um, but of course today we'll be talking about the visual effects of scenic design and costume design. So. Our first term on page 74 is looking at style. Now style is a sort of term that can mean lots of things in everyday speech. You might like the way someone styles their hair, you might like the style of someone's clothes. The style we're talking specifically about in this term is production style. And that is we've kind of created genres through art, through music, through theater. And so part of being a researcher in theater design is familiarizing yourself with these different genres. So um, if you have a director come to you and say, I really wanna embrace the Gothic style, then you get out your art history books, you get out your theater history books and you go and research these production styles. Um, that's absolutely a, a direction that you can go for much ado is pick a production style and try to embody and embrace uh, the visualization of those periods. So this first one you may have guessed is surrealism or the dreamlike state. Hopefully you learned a little bit about this in intro to theater. Uh, next I wanted to show you an example of romance, romantic, traditional romantic um, a production style. This is definitely the one that I've embraced for Much Ado About Nothing. Charm, whimsy, detail, and uh, overall sense of um, beauty. And then we have the Tim Burtons. We have the expressionism and the nightmare. Now, you know, if you look at Much Ado, there's definitely some nightmare elements, and you can embrace one side. Um, you know, if you want to focus on the villain and just his aesthetic, uh, of course, you can break down certain elements of the production style um, and, and be nuanced that way, as long as you have an overall sense of continuity and harmony, which we'll talk about today as we go through our lecture. So, literary style is also something to be concerned with. So, when we looked at our last lecture, we talked about how the script is the thing. The script is where to start. Our story is what's important. Um, so we can look at that overarching story and say, oh, well, maybe it's just a romance. But then if we get into the literary style and we see, oh, this has King James English in it. It's got these and thous. It's got heightened rhyming couplets, poetry going on. Then that's sort of a hint to us that we can raise the genre through the literary style. You know, if we look at opera, if we look at ancient Grecian, um, you know, tragedies like the one pictured here, they have a heightened literary style, and that's a hint to us. But this can even be broken down between characters. Shakespeare has those major characters who speak in poetry, and then he has those minor characters who speak in prose. So we're going to address Juliet, and she's saying, um, gallop pace you fiery footed steeds and she's got this um, beautifully formal costume on we can have a little more fun with the nurse who comes in and sells sex jokes right so looking at the style of the way that the person speaks can be a huge hint to us as costume designers and um, another word here that they have on page 75 is just speaking about museum theater and this book really discourages museum theater. And by museum theater, I mean putting exactly what is true to the historical um, period on stage. So obviously, I have set mine in the wild, wild west, um, and I have embraced all of the romance of, um, for my design of Much Ado About Nothing, I've embraced all of the romance of a, a country western movie uh, where, you know, they're riding their horses off into the sunset at the end. Now I know as a piece of history, that's really not accurate at all to what was going on in the 1880s in California. Um, the whole 
country western genre that is television is grossly historically inaccurate but the genre that i've embraced is romance right um if i were to do something um completely museum theater it would look a lot different right we would have um, a lot more hats for one <laughs> uh, so if if museum theater is what you're after i I think that the book is a little quick to dismiss museum theater. I think that a lot of people, um, as a person who participated in outdoor drama, I think a lot of people are interested in the real life history and seeing historical costumes and seeing, um, you know, those sort of educational theater. Um, but I think they're right to say with most literary um, plays that you get, the, the genre of plays that you're getting uh, in academic theater um, hopefully in professional theater, most of what you're going to interact with is not historical theater, is not museum theater. So embrace the literary style, embrace the production style, find inspiration there, but don't chain yourself to accuracy is his advice, which I think is good advice. Um, so you've read the script, you've considered the um, production styles, you've done some research about the literary styles, and now we're moving into the bread and butter. So if we have a recipe, you can think of the elements of design as the ingredients, right? If you have a recipe, you can think of the elements of the design as ingredients. I find these so important that I try to introduce them in whatever small way I can in the intro class, intro to the theater class, um, just because they're so fundamental and I think they really help us in all areas of our lives, picking out what to wear that day, picking out our curtains, um, just understanding basic elements of design can inspire us. Uh, they're the building blocks of all of the arts. So, um, of course, today, I'll, you know, I can talk about something like harmony uh, with music, but of course, today I'll be focusing on theater design as my examples. So the most fundamental thing we have is line, right? The most fundamental element of design is a point uh, a connecting to, uh, a mark connecting two points, that fundamental line. Um, it can have value, it can be curvilinear, it can be angled, it can be jagged, it can be serpentine, as it says on page 76. Um, I chose mascara smudge there, eyeliner smudge. Um, a line can express emotion. You'll watch a costume lecture uh, in the next few units um, where she uses an example of, you know, soldiers have these straight, rigid lines. And when I uh, designed Babes in Toyland and had those fantastic tin soldiers that, you know, are very iconic uh, Rockefeller Center. If you've ever watched uh, the Rockettes, they do the tin soldier dance too. And those sharp lines, those military type lines, um, even the choreography, you can see those beautiful straight lines in a rocket dance when they do the tin soldiers dance and the precision that the Rockettes have in their kick line, right? That rigid harshness. You can contrast that with a romantic ballet like what happens in singing in the rain when she's doing that beautiful dance and she has that flowy scarf and she has the windmill on set um not windmill a uh, big wind fan on set and you can see the moving scarf in the wind and i was so just in love with that scene uh well i loved all, all of uh, uh dancing in the rain but uh, singing in the rain but I, I particularly loved that scene with her and her scarf um doing that lyrical dance you might call it a ballet dance um, but i think she's wearing flat shoes so um you know just looking at those lines choreographers think about lines uh, combat we think about lines, um, but definitely in costume design, are we going to have um, these curvy lines that speak to the romance and the, um, you know, warmth? Are we going to have those military lines like Babes in Toyland with those tin soldiers? Um, so you can think about how that communicates um, to your audience. Are we seeing, uh, um, you know, straightness? Are we seeing curviness? Or are we seeing uh, angles. So in your first few reads of a script, kind of make those notes for yourself. And sometimes when you're feeling the character, when you have the moods of the play, you know, draw, let yourself just doodle in the margins. 
and find those lines that express the character. Um, I've always been an actor designer. I've always been an actor technician. And so I kind of do this sort of um, doodling and, and all of that kind of goes into my character analysis, even when I'm not part of a design team that's part of my um, me sort of sketching out the character as part of my actor work. So everyone has their own process and it's all interconnected. We're all on the same page. So when lines come together, they form a shape, right? We have many different shapes. Um, the quality of the lines connecting all together, creating an enclosed space, we get shapes. Um, probably the most important when we're talking about costume design is that word silhouette on the middle of page 77. If you have your pen, just go ahead and underline that. That's a hugely important. Um, is the silhouette of the costume. And you want to have, um, I, I worked on this Western once, actually, since we're already talking about Western, um, uh, called Flaming Guns of the Purple Sage. And my director did this really cool thing where the psych light behind us would light up a color. And then we would, in our silhouettes, assume almost like a shadow story. We would create a visual uh, with this light behind us, told just through shadow, no front light. Um, and that sort of storyboarding, that almost comic book way of telling a story is so effective. Uh, it communicates things to us almost in a sil silent film kind of way. And so what is the silhouette? What is the form telling us about the character? Even before we add color, even before we see the texture of the costume, what is just simply that shape speaking of that story? How does it help tell the story? And of course, part of that depends on your director because they're the one um, manipulating those physical choices for the actors helping to create those stage pictures, but they're, those shapes are going to be hugely important. All right, moving on to page 78. I think that was all I really wanted to... Oh, we're going to come back to 77 in just a moment. But. So measure it's a really important concept and I have a, a silly picture of Pee Wee Herman here because you'll watch the video um, today and if you haven't already you can go ahead and pause this lecture and jump over and watch the video of the Hamilton set designer talking about when he worked on Pee Wee's Playhouse, um, his TED video, he, he talked about making the stairs uh, disproportionately large, right? And so when Pee Wee Herman is playing this little child, he gets to stomp up the stairs that are oversized. And that communicates to children, I'm like you. I see the world like you see it. Um, I had the pleasure of going to Disneyland before, all, uh, Disney World before all this craziness happened uh, this time last year. And I was down in Florida and walking into Toy Story Land. Um, my son had never even seen the films, but just these oversized toys, um, you know, just... It was so fun for him to have this disproportionate. Now, those are extreme cases. Really, what we're talking about when we're talking about proportion and measuring is um, judging the size of objects relative to the space around it. So if I'm going to create a door frame, let's take this to set design, um, you know, a standard door uh, is going to come in one size. But if I have a little tiny set, I might not be able to use a standard door because it may look disproportionately large, right? So measuring um, the uh, proportion and judging the size, relative size of, that object should be is um, sort of, some people can do it intuitively, um, but then you can also, um, you know, really get out your measuring stick and sort of see is, is this, the size that's going to draw attention. Do I want it to be, you know, there's this beautiful moment in um, the description of the set design for Glass Menagerie where they talk about how there's a portrait of the father center stage above the fireplace and it pulls focus. You know, he makes it clear in the stage directions because this missing father is really what the play's about. And, um, you know, there's, stage directions about how big that portrait's supposed to be. And so, um, you know, there, there are those, especially if you're doing, I would consider Glass Menagerie um, a surreal play. Um, 
a poetic realism play. And so, you know, it's going to have those, just like a dream would, those disproportionate sizes. But if you're trying to do realistic drama and you don't want your set to pull focus, make sure that things are um, proportionate, right? Make sure that they measure correctly. We'll have a whole lecture, I guess lecture next time, um, over chapter six where we talk about color because it is, of course, one of our most varied and useful tools in our tool book. Uh, now I'm mixing my metaphors, I apologize. Uh, one of our biggest ingredients in our recipe. So texture, right? I've been at, watching The Mandalorian this semester and they've just got fantastic textures. The Mandalorian himself with that metal, just the buff and the shine. Um, and then of course, uh, you know, when I'm doing these children's plays, we want to spend extra money on this fur to help students really feel like the dog or the bear or whatever animal we're creating, uh, that they can go hug it after the show and feel that texture and feel it invites them tactically into the, into the world you're creating. Um, and of course, uh, textures have meaning. The difference between a sundress and a wedding dress, you know, people look at that and they're like, why is the price tag on a sundress $10 and the price dress on a wedding dress can be $1,000? And a lot of that comes down to texture, right? Do you want a muslin or do you want a raw silk? Uh, huge differences in the quality of your fabrics and, um, you know, those textures help tell the story. They help the audience understand how wealthy you are, how poor you are, how um, fancy you are, right? Those textures matter to audiences and helping to tell the story. Um, we can create texture through our lighting design, as they talk about on page 79, halfway through, using a gobo, which is a little metal um, tab <laughs> and you put it in front of a light and it casts shadows and you should have learned about that in intro to theater but then that creates a textured light on stage um, that can tell a more nuanced story especially if you're creating like a, a scene in the woods like into the woods and you have a textured gobo that just creates shadows to make it look like you're walking under the trees and that added bit of texture makes it more real, makes it more visually interesting. So, um, you know, having, being intentional with your textures can help pull an audience into a story. So lastly, I wanna go back and talk a little bit about mass, right? So when we look at the, the texture of something, a lot of the time in the theater, we're using the fake of that, right? We can't afford, um, you know, real, um, silk, so we're using a polyfiber, uh, a poly blend that is meant to impersonate a, a silk. And the same is true when we're doing prop work. Um, perhaps one of the most, uh, the ones that's the most relatable is that Tin Man, right? He's supposed to have this rusted, um, and his physical movements should indicate that mass. He's almost like a, you know, turn of the century robot. He should have that clunky um, gestures, that sense of heaviness. Now we can't actually make the costume heavy, or at least we shouldn't because that's a burden on the actor and we want to make the actor comfortable, which we'll talk about more in chapter 17 and 18. Um, but creating that mass help helps us understand the, it kind of goes back to scale to that largeness um, but if it's supposed to be heavy, if it's supposed to feel heavy, then the actor can help embody that. But then you can also, as the costume designer, um, you know, pad that out, make it feel more dense. And through your shading and your texturing, you can also kind of create mass. Um, and uh, I just finished watching Ma Rainey's Black Bottom on Netflix, and Viola Davis did a fantastic job. And I was reading an article where she was talking about how she felt so sexy because they padded out her butt and, um, and her stomach, and she just felt more sensual than she had ever felt. And I thought that was really body positive. Um, because, of course, going into any conversation about costume design, you 
initially have this body in front of you that you're working with. And um, some of those bodies have more mass than others, and we're going to respect all the bodies. Um, but sometimes when you're trying to create a certain line or shape, it means um, changing that body by patting it out in certain places. Uh, you know, if you see a more rounder um, character, and um, you just want to make sure and always communicate with your actor about that, that this is um, an intentional choice. It's not any deficiency in your body. We've had enough um, in entertainment circles of body shaming or body negativity. And so we just want to make sure that actors know that this is all um, for the lines and for the visual picture because our bodies are our instruments as actors. And so, um, but it's, it's hard sometimes for for actors not to take that personally when you when you start ma messing with their natural shapes um, and so and if you're doing a more cartoony show um, I love a script called Skipan that we did in my in my graduate school you know it may be that you have oversized if it's the father for example he had an oversized belly and uh, if you know creating those over the top characters uh, you know I played a Russian babushka and they gave me oversized breasts uh, to create this sort of ridiculous character. And so, um, you know, depending on what the genre of the film is, that can be appropriate. Of course, if we're doing something more subtle, when we just talked about Glass Menagerie, you know, building out um, may not be as appropriate uh, depending on um, your director's interpretation of it. So I've been using Hamilton as a case study last lecture and this lecture. And you can just see these beautiful bold lines. Of course, the cover of Hamilton, the poster, which you may be familiar with, has a star at the bottom and Hamilton doing a similar gesture at the top, kind of a rock star gesture at the top of the star, finishing off the top of the star. Um, but that really recognizable silhouette is part of what makes that iconic um, initial star in this iconic uh, Skylar sister silhouette. We see that... Um, it sells stickers, it sells shirts, right? Those bold lines help tell the story. We've got so much continuity between these different dresses, but you can see the subtle differences between the three, right? Some of them have peplums, some of them come to a point, some of them have buttons on the side, but we still have mostly monochromatic. We still have, you know, this ruffle is smaller than this ruffle. So it's, it seems subtle, but these um, beautiful, bold silhouettes that stand out so beautifully accented by our lighting design it makes for just a really powerful moment with the choreographer has set up there. So shape. And when we're talking about mood boards, we're talking about creating characters, um, shapes can evoke emotion, right? And um, our set designer said in that TED Talk that circles were really instrumental for him, that that turntable in the middle um, really evoked the sort of cyclical nature of Hamilton's life. We've got the hurricane that's going on here. We've got Burr and Hamilton, how they keep meeting and re-meeting and hashing over the same arguments over and over again. And of course, we have hip-hop turntables, um, which he may not have said in the TED Talk, but he, he did say in other uh, research that I've done. So we see in the turntable how this inner circle turns one way and this outer circle turns another way, uh, which we can see uh, in the first time that the Schuyler sisters go downtown and they're trying to keep up with this outer circle in their heels and, and almost um, comically clunking uh, towards downtown with all of that veracity and pace that the show requires, just such fast paste and keeping up with that turntable. But that, that cyclical shape, that circle shape was really important to our um, set designer and it definitely, um, you know, speaks to the sort of music of the show, which I think is really beautiful. Um, so we have a really striking picture here. Let me come back to um, uh, this measure, this position, we talked about the oversized stairs, and we have this arrangement on stage of Hamilton, front and center. It's just a beautiful focal point, which we'll getting get to in just a moment. 
So we look at color, and I know there'll be an entire guest lecture next class, but I just had to bring up the evolution of color, that arc of character that we've created for Hamilton and how he starts off as one of many. We move into him being green, of course, as the treasurer, but also um, as a uh, wealthier man himself, right? And then, of course, after Philip dies, we move into mourning in a more sophisticated black. Now, the Schuyler sisters, we see this bold silhouette at the beginning that has changed to umpier by the end of the show with the change of the fashion. So that could maybe be a more um, startling difference between the costume, um, but that subtle use of color as the evolution of the story is told is really beautiful. So Corin said in a Vogue interview, and I mentioned this last lecture, that they looked at 33 different versions of brick. 33, right? Um, a good collaborator um, thinks about how the colors go together. And it can be a very nuanced and frustrating process, right? That's why we get out our, our Pantones. We send each other swatches of fabric or paint chips um, to really get on the same page about color because it can kill a show design quicker than anything not being on the same color page. Um, and nothing is more frustrating than having to go in and do touch-ups um, to your color on your set, you know, two weeks before uh, you go live just because you didn't get it right in the beginning stages of creating your concept. Um, so getting that color collaboration can be really um, it, intense. Like you said, 33 different bricks. Some were too beige, some were too brown. We had to work with the different skin tones to make it look good, right? Um, so a lot to consider there. And, uh, you know, I just, I, to share a personal experience that was not so great. I feel like this is a safe space and I can do that. Um, I worked really hard on one of the first fully my costume designs, which was um, the Scottish play Macbeth in my undergrad. It was my junior year. And uh, I handmade these kilts. I handmade leather armor. It was just insane amount of work. And then we also had a new lighting designer who came in and put on all these great greens and just totally muddied um, my look and I look back on those pictures and I just kick myself for not having those hard conversations about can we change the gel color I know it's a lot of work but it really muddied up these costumes I worked so hard on so well, I was uh, n not willing to to go there because we were just on a dead run to get to the finish line but if I had it to do over again I would fight for uh, those clean colors. It's one of the good things about being a one-woman show. It, I get to choose the <laughs> gel color because I'm the one at the light board, and I get to choose the fabric color because I'm the one who picked out the costume. So there are advantages to being a one-woman show. Um, I would much prefer not to be, but here we are. So textures. King George III is a great example of costume texture. Uh, we have that fur on the drape. Now you notice King George doesn't have to do a lot of dancing, right? We talked about when you heard the costume design lecture uh, that is over that pattern cutting, you can see um, how most of them are made out of stretch fabrics, lycra fabrics, but these beautiful textures, these ornate golds, these jewels that reflect, um, all that the royalty had to do was walk in and wave, right? They can wear all of the heavy restricted restrictive costuming that they um, require and it definitely sells the character and the regalness of the character all of this lace was a huge status symbol around this time because the poor little um, knitters knitting every little eyelet uh, it's not like today when you can just buy it off the bolt although lace today is still pretty expensive uh, but nothing like when it was handmade um, at that time and all of this impractical satin right you spill one drink and it's gone uh, but it's so beautiful showing off that calf so important this time period the advent of ballet 
So we have our ingredients and now we're going to talk about composition, how to mix them in the pot, how to arrange them on the page. So, and I know we kind of, I will say it can be a little confusing for students because we talked about position and that sort of is a composition issue, but it, it's mostly, so I, I understand that, you know, that one's position and measure sort of in the middle, but um, moving on completely to principles of composition. The biggest thing we want to have is unity, right? This is a picture from Wicked set. I love Wicked. Uh, just one of those so powerful, moving experiences in the theater. I've getting to, gotten to see it several times. Um, it's definitely music I sing in the shower entirely too loud. Uh, we see these little tiny gears, right? Those little tiny gears that expose the wizard for the... Um, his machinations, the way that he's making things and um, manipulating this world around him. And this is, of course, if you've ever seen Wicked, there's a huge dragon up here that's being moved. But we see those those tiny little gears also on the costumes. We have a projection when the monkeys are released of also those tiny little gears moving. So to me, what those tiny gears represent is the unity between the set design, the costume design, and the lighting design. They're all on the same page. We see those tiny little gears on our props. So when we see this creation of a stylistic plan that, that meshes together, that all uh, subscribe to the same conceptual thread, we have unity huge goal and I think part of the reasons designers like to work with each other over and over again is because they start to mesh together they start to form a community and when you have that community you create unity right working as a designer with a new designer can be very um, you can it can be harder to kind of create that unity but once you've worked with someone for a few shows you kind of create a sense of ensemble just as you would with a cast so harmony Harmony is a sense of unity. It's created through order, right? Through repeating patterns, through safe choices. We have this sense of, ah, oh, all is together. All is well. If you took my theater appreciation class, you know that there were certain um, theater production times that were obsessed with harmony and unity. If we look at French neoclassical, they wanted everything to be perfectly symmetrical. They wanted everything to have this over sense of harmony and um, pattern and comfort, right? You can just see how we have, um, you know, this and on each side, we have these repeating forms that create a pattern that feels very consistent. Uh, what's what's wrong with harmony? If you have too much harmony, we get boring, right? Too much harmony creates monotony. Uh, you know, I I don't necessarily enjoy French classicism. You know, you you get those rhyming couplets and it feels a little over redundant, right? It feels a little overly simple. I much prefer the romantics who throw in lots and lots of contrast to show like Les Mis that's ugly and all over the place. Um, you can see here we have a centerpiece here on the set design that's full of random rectangles all thrown together in the middle there. And that juxtaposition of dissimilar elements, feeling that disharmony, feeling that... Um, you know, wacky, jazzy moment breaks up what can be a, a boring, monotonous oversimplification, right? Through a little splash of contrast. Now, what happens if we have too much contrast? Then we start to feel chaotic, right? So there's a balance there between harmony and contrast of feeling like, okay, we've got a clean melody here and feeling like, ah, it's just, you know, crazy jazz uh, on top of each other. So um, this, this personality, this center point here, adding that contrast there is going to be our focal point on the wall. No choice. It, it uh, draws the eyes because of that contrast. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to bump my mic there. Apologize. I hope that didn't hurt your ears. So variation. Um, variation is creating visual in interest through a pattern repeating 
um, but creating uh, differentness within that repetitive pattern. So we have these clock faces on a set design here. They're the same clock face, but they're different varying sizes um, hung at varying spots. So we've still got a pattern, but we're creating a sense of differentness, a sense of um, breaking up that monotony or those monotony, monotonous elements with um, difference, right? Still a pattern, but that variation is what draws us in, right? Anybody who's taken music also has studied that. Um, creating accents, right? Creating um, that one throw pillow that's a bolder color that adds a little spice to your story there. Um, and we have to be careful because if we add all visually interesting throw pillows, then we get mush, right? We, we get a too much. But choosing those accents, choosing that variation is important. So next we have balance. We have two types of balance, of course. You've probably studied this before. We have symmetrical balance, like the one here where we have a high platform and stairs on either side. You can feel the consistency. You can feel the strength of those arches matching on either side of it. This is a really common symmetrical set design, especially um, in uh, musical theater where we have lots of people on stage and need to create a larger stage picture. Um, Madagascar, which we did recently, had a very similar set design as this um, because it is uh, pretty, you know, useful when you have a large cast like we had for the musical Madagascar. Um, but it can be difficult for us at Motlow because of our sight lines. So we can't have um, a lot of action going on for over here, for example, because of the shape of our house, it fans out. So our sight lines are kind of cut off. But we'll talk more about that um, when we get to set design more specifically. But this is a very common set design that we see. Um, community theaters in the area I'm in use this um, balanced set design often. Um, so an asymmetrical balance uh, is where we have um, not that sense of things are equal on both sides, right? We have more of a tension, a juxtaposition. We have it lopsided, right? Um, so it uh, creates emphasis. Let me come back to asymmetrical balance in just a second because I didn't include a picture for that because I wanted it all to fit on one page. It took me like an hour to make this slide, but that's okay. I think it's pretty. I like it. So. I feel like if you're talking about composition, you have to compose things nicely. Is that vain? It's probably vain. But um, so emphasis, <laughs> I'm kidding, emphasis, drawing the audience's attention or eye, right? The most, you know, the lowest hanging fruit here in the example of emphasis is you have your actor who's starring in the play in something different, a different costume than your chorus and your ensemble. Right? The rest of the ensemble, for example, in Hamilton, they're all white. Hamilton's got something different on. Um, and that draws the eye, right? Hello, Dolly. You know, she has, this Dolly character has on tons and tons of sequins to keep the emphasis on the person on which the name of the play is, um, is given. Now, this can be, you know, if you're doing amateur theater and everybody gets to dress themselves, um, you sacrifice some of that emphasis, right? Um, and that can be a struggle. If you, you know, your uh, third chorus member finds a sequence dressed at Goodwill and they want to wear it, you know, what are you going to do? Uh, but that's, those sequins are going to pull focus the whole show. So some community theaters, you know, spring for um, costumes being provided rather than letting people provide their own costumes because if they do, they can pull the emphasis away from the main characters if you're not careful. Um, but that's a luxury we don't all have, right? Um, we, we have to stay humble. So, so going back to that harmony element on page 80. So this is Hamilton, <laughs> if you haven't already caught the trend. I'm using it as our um, jumping off point. Uh, you can see that our set designer has created these gallows, um, uh, you know, in this repeating rectangular 
uh, pattern that just sort of creates almost columns. It gives us a sense of scale of how large this set is, but it also adds a continuity and a cleanness uh, through this repeated pattern of these scaffolds. So um, we've already established this as a construction site and, and seemingly the bricklayer needs this to uh, scale and, and create more bricklaying. But just, you know, I've added these rectangles to help show you how consistent and how the pattern helps create a rhythm, tell a harmonious story to create that beautiful um, that beautiful set design that doesn't pull too much focus away from the story, but helps us feel secure. Uh, I think it's interesting that they have profile and silhouette on page 80, when we talk about line back on page 77. That's kind of frustrating, I don't know why they put that there. But here we are. So most of the show, as they talked about in the videos that provided, um, is so balanced, is so harmonious, because we have to focus on those words. The words are the thing. But hurricane is definitely that moment of juxtaposition, that moment of chaos and jazz and um, explosions is just um, psychologically stressful, more so. Now it's a calm song, I don't mean to say it's a crisis, but... Uh, manipulating that contrast and having that strong crisis there early on in the story um, creates that contrast, creates those dissimilar forms, um, which is very visually compelling. So here we have variation. Like we said, that pattern of feeling like there's some consistency, that, um, but there's just a little bit of breaking up that variation. So we see a basic uniform here, high boots, uh, knickers, uh, the same even except for Hercules Mulligan has a little bit longer of a trench cut style, but the same basic shapes going on here. Just the variation in color helps create a pattern that's just different enough so we know they're individuals, but continuous enough to where we can tell that they're a team. They're playing on the same team. Right, which is um, visually so compelling. Um, I just did not talk about asymmetry. Where are we? Yeah, this is where I wanted to talk about asymmetry. Right, so we have a very, the stage picture here, you can see how much heavier it is on stage left than it is stage right. Just a few little chairs and little dancers over here. Over here we have this big table. You can see that asymmetrical picture there. Um, and it creating a different kind of balance, a heaviness on one side versus the other. So if you're doing a show in um, surrealism or expressionism particularly, you want to embrace uh, the asymmetrical styles. You know, in a, if you look at, um, you know, uh, the same costume designer who did uh, Hamilton also did the live version of The Wiz uh, for NBC and uh, the wizard had this beautifully asymmetrical costume, right? One sleeve kind of business that we get into with some of our sci-fi. And uh, so, you know, you can create an asymmetrical costume as well as a symmetrical costume. You can have age symmetrical stage pictures uh, or you can have a symmetrical stage picture. This would be symmetrical, right? Two forms on one side, two forms on the other side. Hopefully this is a review and something you talked about in your introduction to theater class. All right, so our last example today is of emphasis, um, right? When uh, Thomas Jefferson comes in, he gets to take the whole stage. He gets to really pull the focus. Um, you know, he's down center. He's coming in with the splash, and this is definitely a splashy costume. But I think part of the reason we have to create this emphasis with this costume is explaining how the same actor... Um, David Diggs is playing one character in the first act and a second character. He's playing Lafayette in the first act and in the second act um, he's playing Thomas Jefferson. So we want to see a big splash because we want to see a different uh, character as well. So it's part of the reason that I surmise that 
this character is so splashy and different, but pulling focus, pulling emphasis is so important. And, um, you know, that's part of the reason that I wanted you, when you picked your Much Ado character, to pick one of the main characters, either the villain, one of the four lovers, um, because those are going to be the costumes where you get to choose these fun colors. Those are going to be the costumes where you're trying to pull the emphasis or pull the focus. Um, you know, if you're picking the Night Watchmen, um, Although, you know, the comic relief, I would say Dogberry is the, is the emphasis when he's on stage. Um, he could be a fun character to costume as well. So, um, so you have your ingredients, you put them together to create and com a composition and, um, that's sort of the building blocks of art as we know it. Rules are meant to be broken, right? If you don't want to embrace the symmetry, we each come with our own sense of beauty. What, do, what I like, I have a favorite color, you have a favorite color. Some of you are drawn to harmony and balance. Some of you are drawn to chaos. You're little mischief makers. And I respect that. And I, I want you to create something that you think is is visually compelling for whatever reason. Right. So um, trust your gut. Listen to yourself. Don't overthink it. Enjoy the script and compose those elements, arrange those elements in a way that makes sense to your eye and continue to um, control and embrace and listen to yourself because you are our designers. As always, thank you for listening.